All right, this is module eight, mini lecture, last one of this semester. We're going to talk about uh, Ecclesiastes and Job today. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about um, is the date of the book of Job. Uh, we're mainly going to focus on Job here and our conclusion to wisdom literature. Um, the when we talk about the date of the book, uh, it's kind of tied up in some other issues as well, like the purpose of the book. The purpose is the is to illustrate the problem of uh, God's justice and suffering going on in the world for the righteous. And so it challenges this assumption that personal suffering is a result of sin. Remember, Jesus talked about that too. So. God's world, uh, rule in the world can't be reduced down to some sort of formula. In other words, do good and you're going to have a great life, uh, experience blessing, that sort of thing. It doesn't work that way. So uh, the prospect of grace comes up here and that God favors the undeserving and the just. The just will sometimes suffer in unexpected ways, um, but that God favors the undeserving. Okay. So. Um, then we move on to the fact that the book has a universal appeal. Uh, the experience of Job is, um, something that most people are going to experience at some point in their life. Uh, they're going to go through hard times. They're going to go through times when people offer them bad advice. Um, so it's something that people are going to experience. Then when we talk about the date of composition, it's difficult to assess because there is a wide range of speculation on the time. Uh, everything from patriar patriarchal period, uh, 2000 BC, all the way down to the post-exilic period, um, 500 or later, 500s, 400s, maybe even later BC. Uh, so there's no good reason... Uh, not to see it as pre-exilic um, and take into account that the cultural factors in the book seem to show a time of the patriarchs. Um, that is not to say that there is uh, explicit evidence for this. It is simply to say that based on the relational and cultural phenomenon, uh, it seems to fit within the time of the patriarchs. Um, there are no real historical events mentioned in the text, so you can't really correspond to something outside of the text as a way of, of dating it firmly. Um, <clears throat> some people are going to make an argument that it fits in with the time of Jeremiah because of the same sort of themes. Um, so the date is difficult. A lot of conservatives, myself included, are going to go ahead and say, you know, based on the evidence we do have, the relational, cultural sort of things, it fits within the patriarchal period. But it's something that I personally am not going to be um, dogmatic about because you, you simply just don't have conclusive evidence there. We talk about authorship. It's also unclear. There's no one claimed in the book. Uh, the rabbis associated it with Moses. Uh, that's tradition. Um, but the language and the style of the book is different from the Pentateuch. Uh, it's not necessarily proof against Moses uh, because, again, it's, it's a different uh, genre and it's uh, describing different events. So you'd expect it to have different style. and and content than the Pentateuch. But it's also not really evidence for Moses, okay? Um, so, again, we're kind of left with the idea that we, we don't know who wrote this book. Um, we have a tradition, um, but that's really it. When we talk about the composition of the book, or, or if you want to say the unity of the book, uh, critical scholars will argue that there are multiple texts sewn together, as you're always going to do if you're in that camp, um, because anything that might resemble some time period or ide ide ideological um, p 
period in in the t- in uh, the history of Israel, they're they're going to break these into their own unique sections. That's that's just what you do if you're in that camp. So, especially with respect to chapter twenty eight and the prologue and the epilogue, um, they're going to say there's you know different things stuck together. But again, we we only have the text in the form that it exists now. Uh, there are no manuscripts that exist differently. Um, so it's, it's difficult to make an argument other than, um, other than ideal, ideological or um, content wise that these are sewn together because we don't have any examples of it happening. Um, it also fits together in its form that we have now you know, reasonably well. It doesn't look like it. It's just obviously, you know, things stuck together. Believe me, there are uh, plenty of other texts in the ancient world that do look like that, and this is not one of them. So, setting, um, where where is the setting? It's most likely in the Edom. Some argue for Aram. Um, Edom is the southern desert south of, of the Israelite area. So it's not clear whether this is an Israelite living in Edom or whether the characters are native Edomites. Um, Edomites often had a mm, a sort of belief in Yahweh. Um, they were considered cousins a lot of times to the people based on the Jacob and Esau narrative. Um, so there you go. Uh, the city of Uz is linked directly with Edom and Jeremiah um, 25, 20 through 21. So that's really the background of the book of Job. Uh, when we want to talk about things within the book, we're going to talk quickly about these things. Um, the book is not so much concerned with the existential details of what's going on in Job's life as it is the theological reality of what's going on within Job's life and the theological importance that this has. This doesn't mean that the author doesn't care, that God doesn't care about those details. It just means that that's the point of the book is the theological issue here. Um, people have asked, you know, is this historical? Is this history or is it a parable? Um, you're going to get a lot of different answers. Uh, Baba Batra, this is again Jewish tradition, says parable. However, James 5.11, Ezekiel 14.14, 14, and verse 20, seem to imply this is a historical figure. You are going to get evangelical scholars that come down on both sides of this. I would say historical reality based on James 5.11. So, then... Um, when we talk about structure, uh, there's a prologue, there's three cycles of speeches, um, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, talk. Uh, these cycles get shorter as Job resists the advances of his peers. And then there's a interlude, chapter 28, which focuses us back on the wisdom of God. That's kind of a bridge into the three monologues of Job and Elihu. Um, Elihu's speech is unexpected because he's not introduced or acknowledged really after the speech. It's just kind of there. Uh, it's probably a literary device. Uh, you see this happen in the Pentateuch as well with um, insertions of poetic material into the narrative. Uh, not necessarily a sign that uh, there was this haphazard sticking things together as much as it is a literary device um, to communicate um, and summarize what's going on before and then after. <clears throat> We're giving God speeches. Um, they're not so much meant to inspire terror as they are awe. Uh, you know, this amaze, amazement at how powerful God is. And it indicates that God is intimately involved in his creation and that he cares for it. Once that fact is established, then we see Job being restored in the epilogue. So that is really what's going on in the book. Um, we get some information about Satan. Um, if 
I do A in order to get B, um, does that work? If I won't get B, why should I do A? You know, why should I follow God if I'm not necessarily going to get the rewards? So Satan makes a, a wager that you take away the reward, you're not going to get obedience. So Satan makes that bet there. Satan functions as the accuser, not necessarily the arch enemy of God, but you can't really rule it out either. Um, there is this depiction that he is outside the counsel of God and must get permission from God in order to act against Job. So the buck stops with God. God is in control. Even though Job is not aware of what's going on, his focus is on God as the ultimate cause and that's correct because the accuser cannot do anything without God's permission. So there you go. A little discussion on Satan there. In summary, you know, the book of Job deals with suffering. It deals with uh, the pain that comes along with that. And uh, the fact that good things, I mean, bad things can happen to good people. And by good people, I mean people who follow God. It's happened to me. It's happened to a lot of people I know. Um, and so we see in the book of Job um, the same reality that Jesus gives us in the New Testament where he talks about when, when he's confronted with um, the question of who sinned, this man or his parents. And he says, ne neither one. Um, sometimes in the world that we live in, bad things happen. And uh, we need to remember that God is in control. Uh, that God has the power to change things, and we need to remain obedient to Him and trust God that He can He can restore things here on the earth, but that there's a future hope as well where God will restore us um, if we're obedient to Him. He's going to bless us beyond measure in heaven, and that should give us a hope for being obedient to God even in the midst of the suffering that we live in day to day. I hope that helps you. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, give me a shout at 832-794-1891.